The Lord be with you. And also, also with, you. with you. Amen. Um, it's a delight to be with you this morning. Um, I just marvel at how many people are here. To, to be honest with you, it's humbling. Um, and I'm just a very blessed pastor. We're going to get underway here with Revelation chapter 15. Um, have you ever played golf before? I, I, I'm new to the whole. Not well. Yet. Okay. But like the first front, like when you're doing a full, full 18, the first front nine is like this takes forever. And it's like trudging through. And then you turn to the back nine and you get on the 15th hole and you're like, oh, I only have so many holes left. Well, we're kind of at that point in Revelation. Okay. Uh, we have trudged through a lot. And now we're on chapter 15. There's only 22 chapters. Now don't worry. A few of the chapters coming up get split. Okay? we got to spend a little bit extra time on the chapters. But we're in the back stretch here. We're in the back stretch. And it's been a, quite a journey. Uh, I, I've learned an unbelievable amount. I pray you have well, as well. And I just continue. You all have ran away. Um, like... Yeah, because you're all still here. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Well, let's start with prayer and let's get out. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord God, that uh, through the tribulation that your light shines and that you're there for the church. We ask, Lord God, that through your word you would embolden us to go forth and shine you to the nations so that more people would be counted amongst the sheep on the last day. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. We're going to do an introductory here. Um, we're moving on to the last sevenfold vision. Okay? Last one. There's three of them. We're two thirds done. Now we get the last. The first two, six. Chapter 6, 1 through chapter 8, 5, 7 seals. Okay? Then 8, 6 through 11, 19, 7 trumpets. Here we're going to see the last sevenfold vision described to us as bowls or censers, depending on the version you have of the Bible or whatever commentary you read. In the ESV, you have bowls. Brighton talks about censers. Okay? Same thing, just different name. Okay? First five censers, chapter 16, 1 through 11, each take place congruently, covers the same time period from Christ's ascension to Armageddon. Okay? That should not be unfamiliar with us. Same thing with the, the um, trumpets and uh, what are the seals. Okay, We've talked about that before. So the first five, it's in this time period that we're living today. Okay, The next two are going to be seen at a specific time towards the end. Okay, We have to keep that in mind. They have yet to happen. Okay? Sixth censor takes place prior to the end of this present world. So right before the end, before Christ's return, that sixth censor is going to describe the last battle for us. We've had bits and pieces of that. We've had different perspectives of the last battle. We're going to get it again here. The seventh censor envisions the end of the second coming of Christ. So we get that picture of Christ coming back to us. That's the introduction. We set this up because chapter 15 sets up chapter 16 when all these bowls are unfolded. Okay, or censors. So a little background there. Let's read the text itself. I'm going to read it in total. Okay? Got to get a flavor of it. 
Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what happened to the sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image, and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass, with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Say, here's another hymn verse, okay? Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came seven angels with seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chest. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bulls, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke and the glory of God and from his power. And no one can enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. Revelation 15, 1a. When you ever see that A on something, you read that verse to the first comma and then stop. That's A. Next comma is B, C. That's how that works. Okay. So this is this little section that talks about, and I saw another sign in heaven. There's two other signs given in Revelation. Revelation 12, 1 and in Revelation 12, 3. This sign here is described as the whole vision, the whole vision that is seen is great and marvelous sign. So what he's saying is that these sensors are great and marvelous. Whoa! You think everybody's going to call them great and marvelous? No. But they are, and they're for a purpose. We'll see that. We have to understand that the plagues come from God himself. It's a completion of his wrath. The Yahweh will complete his wrath. Let me explain this to you. How gracious and merciful is God? Unbelievable. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, right? He is. And that is shown throughout Scripture. Genesis 3, right? Adam and Eve, big deal, big sin. Does he smite them with his wrath right away? No. He actually comes down in the cool of the day, and instead of condemning them to death, which he promised, he said, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And what happens? Eventually. Eventually. This is true. Well, I was getting to that. Yes. But first, out of grace and mercy, he kills the animal. He essentially pays for their sin through the slaughtering animal, clothes them so that they're no longer naked and ashamed, and out of mercy and grace lets them live. Now they eventually do die, because now death is plagued this world. Wages of sin is death. Everybody from them will die. Okay? But in that moment, they deserved immediate death. And God was merciful. Look at Israel. In the judges, how many times did God extend to them opportunities to repent in mercy and grace? Read the text. They do some awful things. Wretched things. They get in trouble. Then they realize, oh, we messed up. They cry out to God. And then what does God do? Have mercy and grace. Fast forward to 
next board. You know, keep, we keep going. The kings. God in his word said, when he gave the Ten Commandments, he said, if you keep these, you'll be live long in the land and blessed. If you don't, you're getting kicked out of the land. How long did God give ample opportunity to repent? before he kicked them out of the land. Go back and look at the kings. Generations. God allows for repentance. Think about the, the church now. How many years has God give this, given this world since Christ has come to repent? <coughs> 2,023 years, right? give or take years. He's giving ample opportunity to repent because fundamentally what does God desire for all people? To know and love him and to be in his kingdom. That is fundamental. Fundamental. Okay? But he uses these things, the the trials and tribulations, we talked about this, the trumpets, the, the censers, and thus the bowls, to wake people up, to bring them to repentance. However, there's going to come a day when there's no opportunity to repent. The last day. Okay? And that's what it's getting at. Who are these angels? Okay. The angels that come, we saw that in the text. Brighton talks about possibly the, the angel that, of the churches in chapters 2 and 3. That could very well be. What's their purpose? The pur purpose of the, the third earthly vision is similar to that of the second. Namely, to show God's wrath and judgment against the enemies of his church. So that people will, right there... This is the last great effort of God to move the human race to repentance before it's too late. When Jesus comes with a shout of acclamation, and there's a separation. This is a hard reality. This is a hard truth. And I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I'm thinking, man, maybe I should get to work. I gave a devotion here for, for um, the, the Michigan District Board of Directors. And in that, in, in that um, devotion, I talked about the church at rest. There's a church at rest. All the saints who have gone before us are at rest. We're not at rest yet. There will come a day. But as the church on earth today, we are church at work. And this is what the sermon is all about today. For those who have come, gone and those who are still coming, let your light shine before others. So that they may see not me, but Jesus. Okay? Okay. Work to do. Then you get this in 5.2. We only made it through, through one verse already. 5.2 it says this. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those who had conquered the beast and its image. And the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps. Okay. What's the sea of glass in, in, in fire? Well... If you remember, going back to Revelation 4, 6, the sea of glass was painted for us there. And that reminded us that the saints are at peace. Okay? Well, here, saints on earth are still in the battle. We're in the battle. Have you felt the battle lately? I, uh, I'm telling you, this morning was tough. I had a stress dream. Typically happens on a on a night before church. That stress dream may sound ridiculous, but it was terrifying. <laughs> I was.
was in my dream and I was late for the 8 o'clock service. <laughs>
sing in church and songs as well. We do that. Part of our worship is, is singing. Uh, it's the, what Luther talks about. Uh, out of all that Christ has done for us, we're to do what? Thank and praise. Thank and praise, right? Praise, big part of it. We're to praise our God in song. We're to, to worship is like, is, we offer that back to God as, as a sacrifice. And so as we sing songs and hymns, we're joining here in the, in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of it all. We continue worshiping God despite what happens because we are singing about the victory we hold. And what a testimony it is. And so I encourage you to be people who sing. I don't, if you sing like I do, which isn't very good, it's not good, okay? That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. song or don't know the song. <clears throat> Every time we lift up our voice and worship God, we are singing His praises. And so my encouragement to you is to continue to sing <coughs> with gusto. To not be afraid. I, thankfully, I am pointed away from people when I sing in church because I'm at the altar. <laughs> I always apologize to the people in front of me and, That's right. and then they but, understand. But we do this unto death. I'm telling you what some of the most beautiful moments I've ever seen in my life. I was at the bedside of someone who's dying. And we're singing. They may be unconscious. we're singing about who holds the victory. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this victory will be on total display when Christ comes again. Total display. Remember when Christ comes again, it is visual, it is audible, it is loud, it is unbelievable. Let me read this to you about this song that we sing. So we have to understand that the Song of Moses is, is in Exodus 14. Okay. Actually, I think we get that here. Exodus 15. Excuse me. This new song, so it, it's taking from the Song of, Mo, of Moses. It's also known as the Hymn of the Lamb. This hymn, it's a hymn of God's redemptive care. Sung as the church continues to do her work, as the Lord continues the redemptive care in the midst of the battle. Okay? So, I really would like to sit down and take all these hymn verses in Revelation and set them to a tune. Wouldn't that be amazing? Maybe it's done before. I have no clue. But it'd be neat. So we continue this song. Now in the song, it talks about righteous judgment. For your righteous acts have been revealed. What is that? Well, judgment will be poured out in the last sevenfold vision. And we're praying God for his justness, his righteousness. But it's for a purpose, to move the unbeliever to repentance. And so as a church... Should we not be ready for when the unbeliever repents and comes into the house of the Lord? What might that look like? What might the, how might the church be ready for when unbelievers repent and come into the, to the house of the Lord? Or maybe they're not at unrepentance and they're just curious and they come into the house of the Lord. What does that look like? Should be joyful and showing our worship and praise to God and the fact that we can see the Holy Spirit working in lives of those around us and the fact that um, you know, so often we get caught up in the church of uh, Corinth. Where 
whole presentation and his major point was that the church, he used the words uh, radical hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if we need to attach radical to it. I think a church that is hospitable, and it's not just in the doors, but it's being, being hospitable to unbelievers. And it's, and, and how are they going to see and know? Just think about this. How will unbelievers see and know the truth if the church doesn't go forth and engage? I have, I mean, the Holy Spirit can do a lot of things. He can, he, he dropped Paul on the side of, on the road to Damascus. Okay? But, what we know in Scripture is that the Lord uses His church to go forth and share Jesus. And so, we can be there for people kind, caring, compassionate, loving in the right sense. You know? As we go forth where God has planted us. I mean, who here does if you if you're working... If you're working, who here doesn't have a have a, a coworker that struggles? How can you, in the midst of that moment, care for your, your neighbor and and share with them the hope that you have? How can we step? Uh, this is uh, it was quite odd. I, I you know my wife went to the chiropractor on Friday. And we go there. They had a big power outage the day before. And next thing you know, I'm standing there, and it smells like smoke. In, in it. And it's like, that's not good. <laughs> so I'm thinking, well, I didn't really think. I just kind of acted. But how can I care for my neighbor? I, I just met this guy. But to care for his property, I started feeling the wall. Because if it was hot, then we, then, then, you know, that's one thing. I went outside. I'm looking to see if there's flames shooting out the roof. Right? It smelled electrical. But I didn't know I was getting thrown into that. I was able to help in that moment where God put me. Who knows what the Lord did for now I have to go see him and get on Tuesday, on Wednesday. <laughs> get all my kinks worked out. But as a church, this I think this is where Satan likes to Satan likes to have the church think that she can't do the work. And that's a bold faced lie. If we have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as our Savior, the one who was there at the beginning speaking life into being, the one who horrifically died yet victoriously rose, who says all things are possible through me, then what are we afraid of? I remember Dr. Reverend Dr. Dale Meyer, president. He um, it was at it was at um, call day. He's like, "This is the best time to be the church," and I'm thinking, "You've got to be kidding me!" Like, do you understand what you're sending us out to? The chaos.
This is a lot of law, by the way, I'm sorry. <laughs> I get passionate about this. Okay. You have this sanctuary, the tent of, of, of witness. This harkens back to the tabernacle in the wilderness where God promises to be. Okay? Um, God's holy presence was there at the in the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant. You know, and God dwelt in the midst of his people. Okay? Here, uh, you know, this picture of the, the sanctuary of the tent of witness is open, and out of it comes seven angels, the plagues. They're wrapped in pure clothing. You know, they're going out for a purpose. It says this, As the earthly tabernacle embodies God's presence through His covenant with His people in the wilderness, so now the heavenly tabernacle reminds John that God, through the covenant of His Christ, is with His saints on earth, with his righteous acts for the protection of his church and for the final judgment of her enemies. Okay? Right? We have, we're, we have the Lord. Okay? So we have these angels going, this indicating that the angel servants of, of God appear in brilliance and purity of his holiness. The golden censures or belts indicate royalty, either of honor received from the king or of royal family related to the king. In Revelation 1.13, the Son of Man is girded with a golden sash, or cincture, around his chest. Thus the seven angels are clothed in the holiness and righteousness of God and his Christ with the sign of royalty indicating that they are acting on behalf of God in particular, on behalf of Christ, their Lord and King. Okay? That's what that all means. <laughs> Sanctuary filled with the smoke of God. This is the, gl the glory of God and His power. In the Old Testament, smoke was part of the divine presence. Okay? On Mount Sinai, smoke covered the mountain like smoke from a furnace. For Yahweh had descended on it. As a result, the whole mountain shook violently. And then God spoke to Moses. When Yahweh of hosts appeared to Isaiah in a vision, seated in his heavenly throne, and being worshipped by the seraphim in the temple, shook violently as smoke filled it. So terror-stricken was the prophet that he cried out in fear, Woe is me, for I am destroyed. Here in Revelation 15, 8, the heavenly sanctuary filled with smoke indicates the awesome and terrifying presence of God and His power as the same seven angels stand ready to pour out His anger and fury upon the earth. Key point. No one was able to enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Okay? Perhaps John was reminded of the tabernacle of Moses when the cloud of God's glory filled it and Moses could not enter it. In response to this, uh, he calls it Venerable B-Day, which is eight, included that the smoke would conceal the just actions of God so that they would remain impenetrable and closed to mortals until complete. The Lord would come. So we have this holy thing. I don't fully understand what the Lord's doing in it. Okay, I'm going to be honest. It just seems a little odd. But this is setting up to what's come. What's to come. We're going to see the six that are happening congruently. And then it will end. Do we know the time and place? No, we don't. So as the church, do we fear? Absolutely not. We have nothing to be afraid of. We're going to be the ones standing at this, you know, as it's all unfolded, singing, worshiping. We're going to see the Lord do His thing. Until that day, we continue to sing and we continue with our job. This sounds, I sound like a broken record. But have you noticed every chapter kind of talks about it? So it's not really me being the broken record. Maybe that's.
it's important to listen to. Any questions? Yes? Not a question, but just yeah, bring it forward. reinforce what you just said. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues were finished. So it has to come to be. It has to come to be. And I mean, to, for me, that... So, when a balloon flies across the United States, it's odd. And we got war in, in happening in, in Ukraine. You know, Taiwan's probably going to get invaded at some point. You know, I, I, I'm thinking, like, in my entire being, you know what I really want to do? I want to go buy a ranch in the middle, uh, in, the, in the far west of Nebraska, and, and have my brother on one side, and we meet in the middle every so often to say, hey, how are you doing, and be left alone. That would be ideal. <laughs> but is that what the Lord has called me to do? No. Not at all. So, I don't know about you, but I am committed to your care as pastor, to walk beside you through the thick and the thin, in the midst of the tribulation, personal, whatever that might be, corporately, whatever we experience, nationally, that's what I'm called to do. And that's why I, I love to use the word put on the word paint. That's why I got up Despite the dream, despite my aches and pains, you got after it to work. And I'll do that tomorrow. And all I ask is that you join me. Because we do it together. We do it together as the church is called to do. And we press on. Until we can't go any further. Amen? Amen? Okay, I can entertain maybe four questions. And this can be about our text, or it can be about personal life. It can be, I like to do this often, sometimes, just because maybe there's something you want to talk about and we have a little time. Why did you get so concerned about this balloon flying across and we have all these satellites to the next satellites? Right. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because personally, I'm going to speak personally. I don't think foreign objects should be flying overhead. <laughs> and I think it should have been, I think it, I think that thing we could have done with. Well, and do you know why? Do you know why? Because here's the deal. Because when I, I have to deal with other people who's concerned about it. Okay? I do. I, I, I think about it myself. I think of what things mean for my family. But also I have to think about what it means for the church. And as the as the watchman on, on the tower, I constantly, as pastor, have to be looking out for things. You know, could be a harmless moon, whatever. You know, that's fine. But Next thing you know, when somebody's in my office saying, hey, pastor, what do you think about this? Now it's my job to engage with them and to care for them. And I have to talk people off ledges all the time. Not literal ledges, okay? <laughs> but hypothetical ledges. And so it concerns me. How will this affect our people? You know? That, 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 that can be a concern. Are you concerned about that? But that's their government stealing half the deal with. <laughs> I don't get afraid of something that is so visible. It, the things that bother me are all they can get into our computers and children's even and cause all kinds of havoc there. That's what bothers me. And that may not even be another country. That may be our own doing. It. Absolutely. But was I afraid? No. Concerned? Yep. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's one of those things is, interesting. you know, how do we help people through it? You know? I thought the interesting thing this morning is I heard that China says that they now need to retaliate against us because we took down their balloons. Yeah, just, 
you know, you would bring something up and they wouldn't have any idea what you were, they were talking, you know, what you're talking about because they were, you know, so busy doing your job that. So I appreciate the fact that you're you're aware of what's happening out Absolutely. there, so that we, if we do have concerns, we can come to you when you can wait. Well, I'm, I'm also looking, you know, always seeking for opportunity to to bless and share. So, like, I already have a, if something bad happens in Jackson. I've already thought about how we as a congregation can mobilize and bless. Okay? Like our building is set up to be a shelter. Already thinking about it. You know? Uh, so th th I'm trying to think through some things so that we're ready. We're not caught off guard. This is how I function. How I work. Okay. Appreciate you all. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father. May our lips sing your praise continually. For we know that as your church we stand in victory. And so, Lord God, may we go forth singing those anthems of praise, declaring your victory to the nations. We pray through our efforts as the church, individually and corporately, that we would be a blessing to those we come in contact with, to our community. And may, Lord God, that through the working of your word and your spirit, more people would come to know and love you. We ask, Lord God, that you would bring Lynette's and Dale's grandson, not more steps further, that you would call him out of darkness and into your marvelous light, that he would know the truth, of Jesus and that you would set him free from that darkness. We pray, Lord God, that your will would be done now and always. Amen. Right. Blessings. Thank you. Look around. I think this is the fullest this has been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Praise God.